from Microbe TV. This is Tweevo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 79, recorded on July 1st, 2022. I'm Vincent Rackinello, and joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels Eldi. Hey, Vincent. Good to be with you for Tweevo 79. Um, a slight delay here. We were queued up to do this live stream last week and uh, I got a little distracted. Um, unfortunately, uh, in the virological category, personal virology here, um, <laughs> some, <laughs> some SARS-2 infections in the last couple of weeks in my house. So we think our toddler who's who just turned two probably picked it up from daycare yeah. and then um, promptly passed it along to my wife and me. I was actually the last to, to fall after about 48 hours. I was like a scuba diver looking for virus free air for a couple of days <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's but, okay now <laughs> everyone's okay so we're feeling really lucky three mild cases little ones back in daycare um you know some some small lingering effects just uh some um, tiredness and things mm -hmm. like that pretty common um situation but overall um I, I, it felt like um you know a time to celebrate full vaccination and um, related items that really got us through this, a lot of support from friends and family. And so we're back in business. So you and, and your wife are vaccinated, but I assume your child is not, right? Oh, yeah. No, and Vincent. So this was the sort of, um, you know, uh, we, we were so close and yet so far. So the, um, you know, the approval of the vaccines for um, six and under or six months and up, I should say, um, is now here, but we missed that by a week. So we kind of reversed the order here. Um, our toddler actually got infected. And then, um, however, now that she's fully recovered, we actually got the first dose of Moderna um, going this week. And so we're moving forward with um, hopefully mm -hmm. um, some more protection there. Um, but good. we might return to that issue at the end of the podcast. And as we're talking about vaccines and updates and some of the complications around that. Yeah, for sure. So I have been uh, chatting with some of the participants here and, uh, you know, Jeff wrote earlier, uh, I'm here for Nels's beard. <laughs> and then when you appeared, no. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, uh, th first of all, thank you. And it's um, uh, a cautionary lesson for me again and again. Every time I shave this thing, something bad happens somehow. And so this time I think I let down my guard. Um, actually, honestly, so there was a, a SARS-2 related reason for this. So I um, I did, I've just been kind of coming out of hibernation um, and getting back into a little bit of travel um, and took the toddler up to Minneapolis where I'm originally from, visit her grandmother and my mom. And so, to you know, flying with a big shaggy beard and then like that kind of defeats a mask actually. Mm. And so I took it off. Um, I like to take it off from time to time, actually kind of clear cut the forest, so to speak. Um, but uh, it's making a comeback and I think I'll keep it around for a while. All right. Thanks, so, Jeff. <laughs> so let's see who's uh, here. Yeah, let's uh, go around. I, the, I know that Jeff is the room. Uh, Jeff is in Omaha, I'm pretty sure, because I met him Props when I was in Nebraska. And we have mm -hmm. Andrew, who's in New Zealand. Good to see you, Andrew. And uh, I, Barb, uh, Barb Mac, we were talking about ZZ Top. She's over in the UK. <laughs> I'm pretty sure about that. Good let's to see you, Barb. See who else is here? Uh, I love finding out where people are from. Yeah, it's great. Mm. Jeff again. Les, where are you, Les, actually, oh, Les is here. Thanks, Les. Les is oh, hey, one, one of our moderators. Thank you, Les, for uh, stopping in. And I also saw Tom. There he is, Tom in Oregon. Uh, Les is in California. Two of our moderators. Thank you both for, for stopping in here. Really appreciate it. Yeah, great to see you, Tom. Glad you could make it on this one and sounds like the Swainson's thrushes are in full voice. That's fantastic. Uh, the birds Ronnie's are singing. Ronnie's in Miami. Hi there, Ronnie. Good to see you. Simon is in California. Uh, Christopher is from Scotland. Christopher Robinson. Welcome. That sounds Welcome. like a familiar name. <laughs> Literary reference there, I think. Yeah. <laughs> JK is from uh, North Carolina, currently living in Poland. Wow. 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 Welcome. Good to see you, uh, JK. Elizabeth is in West Virginia. You know, I, I 
tried to do this with Amy a long time ago when we started the live stream. She says, no, no, you can't see where people are from. Can't, uh, so I'm, the best. Getting, I'm getting my fix here now. Thank you for Yeah, it. no, I enjoy it too. You and me both. Speaking of where we're coming from, where are you located at the moment? I'm at Vince's the Jersey hut. Shore. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. oh, <wait. laughs> we have a little summer cottage at the Jersey Shore. So uh, I just came down uh, this morning to spend a couple of days um, – down here but i didn't want to leave tonight because there's too much traffic so uh i'm gotcha. here so i have actually a little setup here that i put together from listener support you, you guys uh funds help us do this yeah. and so i think it's not a bad sound it's not a bad image and so forth so agreed uh so morali krishna. krishna from india cool That's welcome great. yeah good to have you uh, here. ryan is from new jersey rural south jersey maybe you're not too far from me actually yeah. uh Down british short. columbia james welcome and good lost laboratory you, hey there lost laboratory good to see you from seattle yeah. mk is from eastern massachusetts uh, magpie is from san diego uh Aereo zone is or eileen new yorker relocated to Asheville. oh good call <laughs> Maureen's from Ohio. Uh, Sean is from Australia. And Mark Markle is from the East End. Claire is from the UK. You know, Nels, there is a program I could get which shows a globe. Oh, we should do that. With everyone's name located exactly where they are. Dots on the map. I like that idea a lot. Yeah. Allie's yeah, yeah. In, Allie's in Baltimore. We, we have a lot of people today. This is pretty cool. This is really fun um, and spread out all over the globe, actually. We need that map to cover it. This is fantastic. Baltimore. Oh, I did say Baltimore, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, welcome, everybody, and uh, thanks to our two moderators. We have some interesting, an interesting paper to do for you today. We have a couple of Great. emails, and, of course, we have our picks of the week. And uh, let's see. North Jersey. Don is from North Jersey, but I have to get back to work. <laughs> It'll be recorded. It will, but we're not going to talk about Novavax. That's you got to go over to this week in virology to hear that. Yeah. So sorry about that. Gary's in Colorado. Uh, Martha is in Munich. Uh, All right. And uh, well, I'm sure more people will tell us. Oh, I love Volvox. Remember those organisms, Nels? Of course, one of my favorites. Really charismatic protozoan, multicellular balls. Just absolutely yeah. stunning. Yeah. Yep. It's a good All one. Right. Okay, let's uh, dive let's dig in. Else. What do we got? Yeah, <laughs> great idea. So you pulled this one from the vast reaches of SARS <laughs> literature, <laughs> which is uh, saying a lot. So there's a lot out there. So and, and this is a good one. I'm glad we're going to tackle this one. I think it's um, overlaps with some other work. Obviously, that's out there. A lot of attention on the evolution of SARS two as we're watching it unfold over the last couple of years and trying to have some sense of what might be ahead. Um, so the Title of the paper is Drivers of Adaptive Evolution During Chronic SARS-CoV-2 Infections. Um, and so this, you know, kind of hits us squarely in Tuivo's um, interest zone, adaptive evolution. Um, and in particular, obviously, this timely topic, um, even more timely for me, as I've, you know, I'm even a little bit congested from an actual SARS-2 infection here. It feels personal now. So I'm, I'm uh, invested here. What is the... <laughs> What's going on here with the evolution? What should we be thinking about? And so the authors here, so it's a group from Tel Aviv University in Israel. The um, head of the group is Adi Stern. And Adi, I met her a few years ago, Vincent. I was at a really interesting meeting, a um, Kavli Foundation meeting uh, in Jerusalem, actually. Um, and so there are these, are these bicameral meetings. There's usually a crew from the US and then a crew from, in this case, Israel or Germany or India. Um, and actually, I was... I mean, this is like half of my world travel is thanks to these meetings over the last several years and, and, and also a spectacularly fun time to, to sort of meet new colleagues and friends. And so Adi um, did her postdoc here in the U.S. in, the, in San Francisco in Raul Andino's lab, actually, before she went back to Israel and opened her own group. Um, first author, Sherry Harari, um, and then a, a group all, I think, from Tel Aviv um, associated with her crew. Um, and so, you know, we're taking up the topic here of um, chronic infection. We've talked about this a little bit on Twivo and might return to some of those 
ideas. And this really kind of came to the forefront, I would say, with the um, with the emergence of Omicron. And where did it come from, actually? It was sort of on this um, slightly different branch on the overall tree. And it was kind of felt like, you know, is this coming out of the blue or what's going on here? And some we talked about some interesting ideas. Could there be a mouse reservoir? And this is sort of a reverse zoonosis. And then um, and, and then back, um, spill back, so to speak, uh, or another kind of leading hypothesis, which I think is maybe even gaining ground. And this this paper will sort of head that direction as well, is that actually chronic infections. So um, and, and when we're talking about chronic infections, the authors actually define that here. So they're talking about weeks to months of, rec of replicating virus. And that's really different than most of the infections, the acute infections. I'm happy to say mine fell into that category. Um, uh, but the, and this is, um, you know, a lot of these cases are happening in folks who are in patients who are immunocompromised. Um, and so here they're talking about, um, you know, genetic immunodeficiencies, um, talking about immunosuppressive therapies after organ transplant, um, treatments for uh, autoimmunity, um, uh, being infected with HIV, mm -hmm. um, which has a big impact on immune competence for obvious reasons. Um, and then also, you know, I think a growing category of patients as well is um, people with um, can uh, cancer, survivors of cancer, people recovering from cancer, in, in particular, the blood cancers, um, hematological cancers, um, and, and a lot of the treatments that they go through and what that means for the immune system going through those treatments. Um, and so we have this growing population, you know, different, I would say, in the history of our species of um, more and more immunocompromised people put that together with SARS-2 and we have a, a growing population of chronic infections. And so I think a really important topic um, to look at. And then Adi Stern and her group are, are coming at this through the lens of evolution as they're sort of what's going on here that might be adaptive. I think um, it's interesting that, you know, they say there's a lack of standardization when people talk about chronic infection and that, yeah, boy, boy that holds for so many aspects of COVID, right? There's a failure yeah. to define what you're talking about. And so as you said, they defined it as shedding for 20 or more days. And that is well beyond an acute infection, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, yeah. I, I also want to note the title, Drivers of Adaptive Evolution During Chronic SARS-CoV-2 uh, Infections. And I, I thought you would like this, Nels, because this it really uses the, the tools of uh, computational biology to get at this question, right? Yeah, I agree. And they take kind of a, you know, <clears throat> a, a multidiscipline approach here. Um, and we sh I don't think I mentioned, so this is was published um, very recently in Nature Medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and they are really taking advantage of, you know, I think kind of, to me, what's impressive here is um, really taking kind of a careful curation, exactly as you're saying, Vincent. So defining a few key terms, putting the, like defining those categories, and then um, bringing the um, sequencing data that's available for some of these patients together and sort of under a curated list where they're trying to control for some things. It's still, as you're pointing out, I'm, my God, it's complicated. So there's so many variables, so many factors here. And you can just kind of pick like at any level of the analysis from potentially house effects, if it's a different, you know, sequencing mm. scheme or a different mm -hmm. crew doing that all the way to, you know, the, the kind of care and treatment that someone's getting. Um, and then, you know, we already um, touched on this, like immunocompromised is like, that's a category, but within that category are all kinds of different, um, you know, possible ways that the immune system might not be at full strength. And so that matters, right? Because, you know, and that's that And the authors, I think, hint at this. I don't you know, it's a, well, as we'll talk about, it's a relatively small study based on some of that complexity, about um, a little under 30 patients. Um, and so, you know, really being able to tease apart commonalities um, in, in some of those categories that you might care about. Is it someone who has HIV versus someone who's, um, you know, being treated with steroids for autoimmunity or something? Are there differences there? And I think currently the answer, you know, maybe to kind of cut to the punchline is it might be a little too early to, to pull out big effects in this small of a population. But I think this kind of puts down a nice marker for how to sort of think about and standardize some of these definitions. And then, as you're saying, put it into this evolutionary context and try to see if there are sort of adaptive uh, patterns that might be useful um, to pull from that. Okay, so the idea, kind of the you know underlying idea here um, is that, uh, <clears throat> and there's and some growing evidence for this, by the way, is that, you know, it's in these chronic infections and not the acute ones where the virus might do most of its quote unquote evolution 
uh, adaptive evolution, right? So it's, you know, the, the um, difference here between kind of um, jumping from host to host uh, as uh, the acute infections sort of continue um, versus spending some time up against the host as a population um, and really going against the immune system, surviving, you know, or the virus is replicating basically, um, you know, is, is able to sustain these high viral loads for a longer amount of time. That means it's sampling more mutations. That means um, it's seeing even in these um, immunocompromised patients, sort of this balancing act, right? There's still, there's no, there is still, it's compromised. The immune system's not gone altogether. If that were the case, this, there, this would, it would, it would go the other direction. There would be, it would not be, it would be an acute infection for a bad reason. Uh, it, it wouldn't sustain because the host wouldn't be sustained. And also, the, I think that you made an important point. It's yeah. not it's not completely absent, the immune system. There's some immune system, oh. right? There's some immune system. And even more than that, we're, since the beginning, we've been um, you know intervening. So um, from convalescent right. plasma to monoclonal antibodies, um, and then now um, you know some of the other tools off the shelf, Paxlovid, some of the antiviral um, pills, um, which is an, also an interesting thing that we might return to in our discussion is, you know, so this idea of virus rebound that we're mm -hmm. hearing about and is uh, pretty common um, in these cases of infection um, where you uh, try to hit it early with these antivirals. So yeah, no, we haven't taken, uh, the immune system is there. And, um, and, and then there's also these interventions. And so especially the monoclonal antibodies, you're putting up, you know, for example, a pretty specific block to the virus. It's still percolating, sampling mutations, perhaps even moving. The authors will get to this idea of uh, niches where maybe it's in the upper, the population that's replicating the most is in the upper airway, come back in a week. And maybe it's a population that's in the lower respiratory tract now that is where the action is. Those could actually be slightly distinct populations that are sort of waxing and waning over the course of these chronic infections that might be going on for weeks and months. So that's, yeah, so that kind of gets at this idea, underlying idea that this is where adaptive evolution might be sort of um, uh, uh, going on. And and then, um, so let's maybe just step back a minute So there, uh, uh, and do a little more of the, the who are, so who are, who are the cases here? And also, um, some more definitions. So the, um, in addition to that sort of length of um, it being a long infection with productive virus replication, the idea is that there's high virus load shedding, um, at, at least at the 20 day mark. They also use that as sort of an inclusion cutoff or a filter um, for the data. So um, it was a little tricky to suss this out, but they have six patients, I think, in their own sort of clinical zone there at Tel Aviv University. Mm -hmm. um, and also the, t the timing here is important, I think. So this is... Um, you know, with um, scientific publishing, we have the sort of, in the SARS-2 era, we have the sort of ripped from the headlines, um, breathless, here's our preprint, here's what we've done. Um, now, you know, going through the peer review process, revisions, getting to a publication. So the actual patients that they're looking at, this was um, in the uh, alpha variant or even pre-alpha variant. So for our pre-alpha to our um, alpha from their um, local cases, and then they add in another 20 or so cases um, to sort of fill out the data set to, to actually get a chance to sort of compare patterns of mutations um, uh, across the genome and to bring in some comparisons as well. So early global cases, um, and then they highlight. So the, actually, now let's let's go ahead and move into the data. So that the first thing they wanted to do was start to compare their patterns of mutation between um, different categories. And so the three categories they they call out are um, global early sequences. So they're going to um, these massive databases of now millions of sequences, kind of rewinding to the beginning, <clears throat> and then asking from a sampling of the early cases um, at each location across the genome, and this is in figure one, um, how many times do you see that mutation sort of repeating itself across the genome? And in the early days, the answer is kind of, a, it's kind of across the board. So there's uh, maybe a little blip up near the three prime end of the genome um, uh, where the spike protein is encoded um, and beyond that. But there's actually a lot of events across the whole genome. And this is in contrast to their two other categories, which are, so they've just grabbed from, as the pandemic has kind of continued, they've grabbed from the variants of concern. Um, 
and look at those, like a collection of those sequences to say, even, you know, in different variants, by the way, but are there commonalities? Are there common sort of patterns of these repeating mutation events? And that actually matches pretty closely to their sample of about 30 cases. Um, and in particular, you see a lot of um, things repeating, not surprisingly, in the spike protein. And so this gets at some of the ideas of antibody evasion, whether it's sort of what's come up and then been these um, at least transient success stories of the variants of concern, alpha, beta, gamma, um, in some cases happening concurrently in different locations, and then into delta and omicron in sort of our current era where um, we're seeing these, you know, sort of subvariants as they've been called, sort of sweeping up, having their day in the sun, and then sort of getting off the stage. Um, and so, yeah, I think you, what you see there then is that is a pretty clear difference um, that matches. And so the fact that it's matching these variants of concern that we infer have been under strong selection, these are sort of the winners in a sense across all of the competition that's happening between SARS-2 populations. And then, and that matches pretty closely to what you see now. Remember, and this is uh, kind of important to, to kind of dwell on this point for a second. That pattern matches pretty closely to just this small collection of 27 patients over you know that month or two. And so basically you recapitulate a lot of that um, what we think is adaptive evolution, even in these short courses um, for one person, basically, it starts to kind of have that same pattern of mutations. And I think that's in some sense that might be the big uh, take home point here is that um, within this really small population in a very short amount of time, you start to kind of get the greatest hits of SARS-2 mutations that we've seen over the last couple of years. So Nels, I, I wanted yeah. to uh, bring up one aspect for, for a little bit of discussion. They say during the first nine months of virus yeah. circulation, right, early 2020, they said 61% yeah. of the substitutions were non-synonymous. And then they say that's what we would yeah. expect under lack of both positive selection and purifying selection. So yeah. maybe you could ex explain what, what does that mean? <laughs> Absolutely. And so this is for that, the third comparison that's different from those two that I've been sort of that, that I've been discussing. And so this is basically, um, you know, in the early days, as the virus is moving through an immuno naive mm -hmm. population, you've got sort of, um, there's, there's not a lot of selection. The vi and the virus, so the virus is having a pretty relatively speaking, and I'm probably, anth of course, I'm anthropomorphizing here. That's e Let me switch it around. It's easier for, for the virus to move amongst this immunonaive population. Mm -hmm. It's gotten harder um, for t t two obvious reasons. One is um, our own um, immune responses that have been, as yeah. a population, that have been mounted. And secondly, the interventions that we've taken most importantly, the vaccines, which um, yeah. then put a lot of pressure on the virus. But in those early days before that, yeah, it's basically, you know, you, it's kind of a free for all for vi for mutations to accumulate because there's no, there, the, you don't need to select on anything. And so you can kind of, as a virus, you can be sloppy about it and still sort of sh show up and, and be in the mix. So what I find interesting is that, so the main selection, which happens as soon as the immune response kicks in, is immune selection. This implies that this virus, when it first entered people, was pretty much ready to go, was fully baked, right? Because you can imagine that it might improve in a variety of ways other than immune evasion, right? Mm -hmm. But apparently it's minimal, right? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and um, of course, <laughs> I also like immediately now you, you think about the political implications, right? As of, oh, was it designed to move through humans? No, I don't I, think I so. Think but, it, yeah. I think it's very possible that this could emerge in animals fully yeah. competent for oh, human yeah. circulation. In fact, that's what is thought about the 1918 influenza Correct. virus. It, yeah. It's something very similar to it existed in birds, and and minimal yeah. adaptation was needed for it to transmit very well in people. Exactly right. Yeah. No, it's totally consistent. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, and so, and then, but so this kind of highlights another interesting point that they then bring up. So there's that, you know, so there's those early days, um, but we're, we're beyond those early days. And in fact, even mm -hmm. in these, in the kind of alpha variant days, in the this kind of snapshot of time, that window of time that they consider, um, you know, there's already, and, and this kind of recapitulates, or not, not recapitulates, but it kind of echoes a little bit, even in that individual patient that's getting potentially, you know, a monoclonal 
therapy or convalescent yeah, serum yeah, yeah. and or plasma. And so, um, and so then that already sort of shifts the game a little bit, but it raises, they, they, they spent some time discussing and I actually have to say, I think the paper does a really nice job of sort of laying out some creative ideas or putting ideas together in a, in a, in a, in a, a, a nice framing. I, I enjoyed that part. It gets a little speculative and this part does, I would say in particular. Um, but so there's the difference between then of course the virus, um, kind of percolating in an immunocompromised host, but then at some point, you know, if this is going to go, is this, if this is going to impact the pandemic, it's going to have to transmit. And so that's one thing that they noted that was different. There's, and they point to one mutation or one location um, in the genome in particular. This is the S1, S2 boundary. So the um, spike protein is divided or gene is divided into these two categories as it's labeled. And um, you see among all of the VOCs um, a, a point mutation. It's I, I'm trying to remember. I don't think I have the letters up here for the alphabet soup of the amino acid changes, but it's a substitution to two different amino acids that you don't see in there, at least in this collection of about 30 patients. And so here it gets a little bit speculative. So they think that there might be something about that mutation um, as it relates to transmission of the virus. And of course, now I think we're getting on to slightly um, complicated space of, of what, what all goes into transmission. Um, but the fact that they don't see that mutation leads them to this idea that the virus in an immunocompromised host is kind of hitting the highlights of adaptive evolution um, for immune evasion, but then there might be a trade-off somehow. Um, mm -hmm. Again, just sort of a proposal, not sort of um, backed up with evidence at the moment, but that that sort of compromises the ability of this thing to then emerge or transmit. And so if that's true, the idea is then that most of these chronic infections will be dead ends, that they'll, you know, the virus will have sort of a longer run versus the acute infections, but in most cases, it'll that that's where that sort of um, you know that it's almost like a personal variant of concern that then sort of steps off of the playing field um, as uh, hopefully the virus is eventually cleared um, with the interventions or or the remaining parts of the immune system that are operating against it. So that's an, I guess an interesting idea, uh, like a little I mean, and worth pursuing. It would be we'll see if that holds up. I guess maybe be one way of saying it. And then also I think you know highlighting from an evolutionary standpoint, kind of our uh, you know operating mission here on Twivo. The notion of like rare events. So when we think about if it's if Omicron, for example, if the origin of this was from an immunocompromised um, host or a set of individuals, um, you know, if there is what we really need to know is the numbers game here. Um, and if that number is high, even rare events um, that then make it out of that page, it's sort of like this sampling ground for um, going against the immune system. And then if in that rare case, if it gets out, then you know, how much does that contribute um, to the ongoing adaptive evolution of, of SARS-2? I think a really important and interesting question. Um, yeah, I think that, that but the, the take home here that's key to remember is that these uh, VO, the changes in VOCs that are apparently successful because you see them uh, th throughout the world, right? They yep. become better. They are almost never present in their chronic sets of or, or changes in chronically infected patients, right? And so that's what Nels is getting at here, that, you know, whatever is emerging, being selected for in these patients, maybe isn't fit enough to make it in the real world. I mean, I don't know if it's just transmission, as you implied. Now, right. It could be something else. I would just say fitness. I think they would have been yeah. better off saying that, right? Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, yep. Um, yep. So... And why that would be is a good question. We we don't know, but uh, certainly would we would like to have more work because this is a small data set, right? Correct, exactly. Um, okay, so that's yeah. And so I think that's kind of where they leave that part. They then do something that's pretty cool and I think uh, interesting. So they look for co-occurring mutations in chronic infections that actually mm -hmm. appear in pairs. So it's not like just one mutation sort of across and then or like looking at mutation by mutation across the genome. It's using some algorithms to ask. Can we see patterns of pairs of mutations that sort of co-occur in any of these cases? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes. So they um, pull out a couple examples. And the thing I like about this is I think it's it's starting to hint at a little more of the virology that's going on beneath the surface here. So we've, for good reasons, we've spent 
um, put most of our energy in thinking about immune evasion changes in the spike protein. But as a virus evolving, there's a lot more going on here. There's a lot more in the parts list and there's a lot more virology happening as these things are getting in, into cells, replicating, getting out of cells. And so they highlight um, kind of a little web of connections um, here. And two in particular, one is a point mutation in the envelope. So you, you have a, if that mutation happens in the envelope, it's more likely that you'll see than this other mutation in the membrane glycoprotein. Um, those sort of, those mutations sort of ride together. And so the interesting thing I think about this sort of co-evolution or co-occurrence and sort of mapping those patterns is it can immediately suggest a functional connection that might've been sort of hidden otherwise from, you know, depending on how you're studying the virology here. Um, and then they see a second uh, one that does involve the spike protein, but if there is um, a, a specific point mutation um, in the spike gene, then they see this co-occurrence of one in the ORF um, 1A gene. And so, um, you know, they don't go much farther than that. Um, and again, this is in that small patient set, but I'm kind of curious to see, and this is, you know, maybe one of the um, like, you know, future directions actually is thinking about with, with the wealth of data out there. Mm is you know and you'd have to be a little bit careful about how you think about setting this up so again there could be house effects in the sequencing so if, if like two areas of the genome consistently get for technical reasons don't get correctly called that might look like a co-occurring mutation um and it could fool you um but uh if if you can account for that and then some other factors you know this is a, i think a really interesting way that evolution um can sort of give you a uh, new a hypothesis for how the virus and some of the proteins might be actually interacting or working toward together in, in how functioning somehow together as the virus is replicating. And so they show even in these small sets. Um, and I think, you know, so how can they do this even with a small data set? It's because there's so many mutations happening, uh, even in these short, relatively short courses of infection, even in an individual, you can already see these deeper patterns emerging. That's pretty pretty interesting. And I think provides some hope that there's a lot more evolutionary signal out there um, that could be mined in some interesting ways. Yeah, I'd be curious to see if this, this holds out. I mean, you have ORF1A, which is the RNA polymerase gene, right? Mm -hmm. and, and accessory factors. And then we have the spike in the envelope. So what's going on there? Is this real? And they do say, you know, we need to do more work here to sort yeah. this out, but it is intriguing. It is. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, anyway, so I th there's um, one of my colleagues here, Nathan Clark, is a, sort of a master of pulling out signals of this co-evolution, mm -hmm. co-occurring mutations. And you, you, know, you can think about it for virus evolution. You can think about it for um, the evolution of like eyesight and things like this. And I mean, it's really like, a, a, I think, a broadly ap applicable tool. Yeah. And the fact yeah. that they're getting signal here is pretty interesting. But you're right, Vincent, they, they kind of leave it there. And then this sort of, I think, hints how they're kind of taking this all of the above approach, um, which is pretty interesting. So they next looked, wanted to kind of see if there were potentially associations between some of the features of their patients. So for example, the age of the patient, the sex of the patient, the treatments that they're getting um, as part of the, um, you know, sort of a, a, a stepping through these chronic infections in a, a, a high resource hospital that has the, the possibility of doing interventions. And so, um, they kind of take some of these variables, and then this is a little bit out, outside of my um, wheelhouse of experience or expertise, but they use a random forest classifier. I, I love the term, mm -hmm. I have to say, <laughs> um, to propose links between some of these features. Um, and the um, kind of as they're um, exploring, I guess, this random forest, so to speak, they propose an association between virus rebound and antibody evasion. Mm -hmm. And... You know that might be a little bit intuitive, right? So if the so the idea would be that the infection is going along, um, the immune system or the, the treatment or both sort of start to get a little bit out ahead of this as you move towards something that might be approaching clearing the infection, but then the virus rebounds, and so they're linking that to antibody evasion. And so I think that at least for me, intuitively, I'm curious what you think, but that intuitively makes sense that you know it's just as that the virus population is sampling mutations. If there's a set of mutations that get up beyond that monoclonal antibody or whatever is sort of the front line of the immune response, then the, that uh, virus population or that part of it will start to expand and the, the virus will rebound through that. That also gets at this idea of adaptive evolution. Yeah. So there's some interesting things here. First of all, yeah. so 
it's, so some patients got antibody treatments and others did not. Yeah. And in fact, in some antibody treated patients, they found antibody ev evasion changes, but in others they didn't. And this part is very curious. In some antibody treated patients, the changes that lead to evasion were, were detected before the treatment. So these changes were just randomly arising and then they're fixed by the antibody treatment. So that's yeah. very cool. And that makes sense. This yep. is something we yes. always talk about. You know, the therapy right. doesn't cause the, the change. That's right, it just, exactly. It just selects yeah. for it. But yep. even more cool is this idea of, of rebound, as you say. So some of these yep. patients, uh, you know, they, they seem to be controlling their infection. Then all of a sudden, the uh, cycle thresholds drop. You know, you get low CT indicating mm -hmm. uh, more virus reproduction. And their idea, yeah. which I think is intriguing, is that the virus cycles between different niches, as you said earlier, right? And that mm -hmm. in one niche, it may, the, the selection pressure may occur where it, it might not occur in the other. So if you have some antibody penetrating into the lower lung, that's where the selection occurs. And then those variants will cause a rebound and in other places, extremely speculative, I think. Uh, and, <laughs> and they make a statement here, and, and, and I want you to explain this. See, antibody treatment is not necessary for driving antibody evasion. Okay, I get that. Yep. yep. Um, and, and, and so that's in line with this observation that they see the changes before the treatment. Yep. What may be driving immune escape is, in some patients, is actually the weakened immune system of the patients, right? So low, is this what you're thinking? Low antibody that doesn't effectively yeah. control the infection, but allows yeah. for uh, evasion changes to emerge, right? Yeah, I think so. I think that's exactly right. And so the, um, yeah, so again, it's sort of this balancing act. And I think, it, you know, so actually, to, first, I wanted to underline your point, which because I think it's like super, not for, this is a Twivo again, like the kind of big picture Twivo. Mm. It's not that it's like, you know, most of, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of evolution is selection acting on standing diversity. And right. so, right. And that's it. So, and whether it's the SARS-2 or across the board and, and sometimes we talk in these shorthands, it almost sounds, I'm guilty of this. It almost sounds like, you know, oh yeah, that antibody, like the presence of that antibody is then uh, causing the mutation, you know, and it's sort of like this sort of almost engineered process, which is, by and large, not the case. Um, and then, yeah, so absolutely. So I think it's, you know, again, we kind of maybe talked about this a little bit, this sort of balance between in, when, in, when you think about our immune systems, one thing that's like incredible about them is how many diverse parallel kind of functions we put at whatever's we've sensed shouldn't be here. Um, you know, SARS-2 as an example. And so it's not just the antibody, like all of innate and intrinsic immunity all at once coming up. And so as what might work for like, if we think about most acute infections, um, you know, that combination of things that's working in there, there's some collection of them. And, and I think in really interesting, different ways among, depending on um, how the immune system is compromised that um, take down some of those things. And so that balancing act between, is this going to clear as an acute one, go on as a chronic one? Or on the other end of the spectrum, if you take away a lot of immune defenses, it will be an acute infection, but it will kill the host. And so, um, the, that's that. I think that is the idea that there is um, there, you're at this sort of balance point um, in a lot of these cases where the immune system is still in the game, but it it's somehow not um, turning the tide. There, in the when you think about the diversity of the virus population as it's sampling mutations, et cetera, there's enough diversity there to kind of keep churning along. And that's where those ideas of like, it's hiding out in the, um, in, in different tissues or different niches as they describe it. Um, I think, it, you know, hold, probably holds some, some weight here again, small sample sizes, but I think this is what I liked about the paper is it's sort of putting together framing, like what are all these variables that you might think about? Um, and the fact that as there, you, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say that the, um, the classifications, these links are, it's hard to say like how, you know, it, how robust are these or what's the basis of them um, just based on this analysis. But I think it does frame out that there, there are these kind of dynamics happening. And so, you know, another place to look for this, which is outside of immune evasion, you'd love to, or antibody evasion, I should say, is um, thinking about some of these antivirals. So, which is a very different mechanism, right? So the mm -hmm. Paxlovid, can you, actually, can you remind 
me, Vincent, how the mechanism on some of these antivirals that we now have. Like well, Paxlovid, Paxlovid is a protease yeah. inhibitor, right? Right. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, yep. Molnupiravir is a mutagen, right? It pushes yep. uh, the virus over the error threshold. And then remdesivir is a yep. chain terminator, uh, targets the polymerase, yeah. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. And so, and I'm sure these studies are happening, I don't, or, and maybe you've already even seen some, but basically, you know, so actually there's a, a famous case of SARS-2, um, Tony Fauci, who is, <laughs> I was just reading, who was describing, um, and it looks like he's doing okay, which is great, um, but he did, ended up doing two courses of Paxlovid. So I think usually yeah. you, tr you try to catch it early, you do that first five days. Um, and then what happens, or what we're seeing more and more cases where it, you know, it actually works really well, the protease inhibitor is working, or the Protease or protease inhibitor? Protease inhibitor, yeah. Inhibitor, yeah. So it's work, yeah, it's uh, uh, and interfering with the ability of the virus to process its proteins, to process spike, et cetera. Um, and then, um, but then it rebounds. Uh, the virus comes back and people are sort of back in the game. And so um, in this case, um, uh, Tony Fauci did another five day course um, as he went through his infection. And also, and so, and actually, you know, that might be a new standard of care at some point would be to, to extend from five to 10 days. So the question then becomes, okay, we're, we're putting that selection. That's a pretty specific different selection, um, to inhibit the protease cleavage. So in the, like, what's, what's at the basis of that rebound? Are there viruses in these populations that are mutating in ways that get around that inhibition? Um, same for the other, you know, are there, are you, are there, is the, or the potential to change the mutation rate downwards in the cases where you're pushing it over? Um, I think those are questions that um, are open and important as we're thinking about how our interventions might actually push the evolution of the, the adaptive evolution of SARS-2 in different directions, sort of in real time here. So far, nobody's found mutations associated with rebound. They all seem to be wild type viruses. So in fact, mm -hmm. rebound does happen in people who are not treated with Paxlovid. So it yep. seems to be a feature of the normal infection in certain individuals. And so uh, I, I don't think resistance, although theoretically it could be, right? But uh, it doesn't seem to be. And by the way, the emergency use authorization for Paxlovid is only one five-day treatment. So <laughs> yeah. Dr. Fauci went off AUA. And, that's uh, right. I'm not sure that's setting a good example, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Or I guess it depends on how you spin it. Like either it's like, you know, it's not setting a good example or like trailblazing for the, yeah, yeah, um, sure, hopefully sure. the therapy. Had. But no, it's, I mean, this gets into a lot of complications too, but yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, no, that's right. And I think that'll be, that's an interesting open question though. Um, will resistance emerge? And then, I mean, that depends on a lot of things, including, um, you know, so currently the number of people like to qualify for Paxlovid or, to, or the availability of it. Um, it's, it's a, a minority of people of cases are receiving Paxlovid. And so there's yeah, also those yeah. thresholds, right? If, there, if any real resistance is going to come up in the bigger population, it's going to, they're going to have to reach some threshold. And I don't think we're close to that. I think it's just, but I do think it is interesting to keep an eye on this. And I'm guessing those studies are underway. Um, if there are mutations yeah. that will, yeah, but yeah, it's a good point. An important one to make is like, we're not like about to unleash some, massively like drug resistant um, virus populations here. I don't think that's in the cards, at least um, in the near future at all. So the the authors end up by uh, saying, which I think is worth <laughs> quoting. Uh, uh -huh. So they say their work suggests that lengthy chronic infections may allow an exploration of the SARS-CoV-2 fitness landscape that may allow crossing fitness valleys when the virus traverses through different organs and niches. And um, ultimately, in one of many chronic infections, a variant may emerge that both efficiently evades antibodies and is also, I would say, fit, and they say transmissible, but as is the case of Omicron. I think the implication yeah. is that the data they have doesn't implicate these patients in the emergence of Omicron. These are too far back. Yeah. But maybe if we looked at more samples, we would find one where you, these uh, these changes. So maybe you could tell us what is this fitness valley idea? What are they talking about? Yeah, no, this is interesting too. And so some of the <laughs> and this is sort of the last <laughs> analysis they do. This sounds like like this is like directly coming out of sort of the Andino lab um, sort of canon from the last decade or more. Is are, are these ideas of fitness landscapes for the virus? And so um, and so and so sort of supporting 
this idea and we'll talk about the uh, landscape is sort of a vague term and some so like what does that actually mean so we'll uh, let's unpack that for a minute but so the data that they're that they're using to support this idea is sort of this the patterns of variation they see over time so not only can you like kind of compare those 27 patients or take the um, genome sort of at the near the conclusion of that chronic infection you can also in some of these cases and this is where you know sort of curating these specific mm. um, chronic infections has some power is you can say okay what is the set of mutations at the beginning sort of the middle and the end of the infection and they do this um, for several of the cases here and um, what's what's so you know in a kind of a simple model of adaptive evolution, what you might expect is that a mutation that's going to make the virus more fit um, will might start at a low frequency in the population. Let's say it's that mutation provides encodes for a change that provides some antibody evasion, and then um, in a simple model, you'd expect it to sweep the population. So the frequency of that mutation is low at the beginning, at the end of the infection. It, it might be that that mutation is like every virus left mm. has that mutation. That would be a, 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 a signature of a strong sweep of adaptive evolution. So, but what they see is not so simple. What they see is like, you might see a mutation that might have that feature of it's coming up, but then it goes down in, you know, a week into the infection and it's back up three weeks later in the frequency. Um, I think Siri is trying to talk to me on my phone. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, that kind of dynamic as mutations sort of come and go is very consistent with this idea with the, they're, they're calling it dynamic polymorphisms in the population. And they're pointing to, you know, what, so what could be some explanations, maybe those niches, other things. <clears throat> um, and so this starts to fit into that landscape idea. So basically um, the landscape, uh, see if I can do this justice um, at the moment here is this idea. So you can draw, it's, you're kind of trying to represent that idea that I was just talking about, about sort of, um, you know, a, a mutation kind of sweeping through a population, you're trying to um, sort of visualize that as literally like a landscape. So um, like a 2D or usually a 3D representation of mutational space. And then the, the peaks and the valleys in this 3D representation are going to be, uh, the peaks are a, fit, a fitness peak and the valleys are a, a fitness you know, or weak fitness, weaker uh, situations, weaker, uh, you're not as fit is the right way to say it. And so then um, the idea is you might then take any, you know, like a, a mutation and then look at its frequency as it sits on whatever you're judging the fitness to be um, of the virus. And so this is a way of trying to bring together these sort of, um, and, uh, you know, courses of mutation across the genome and how that relates to the fitness of the virus. And so their, their ideas that they're you know, getting from a peak to another peak uh, might not work if you have to walk through a valley. You have to go in order for the mutation, the combination of mutations to be sitting at one peak, which is different from sitting at another peak to get there or to traverse the peaks. Uh, if the valley is too deep, you go through a, oh, this is great. You're bringing up one of these. This is much better than me sort of stumbling through this. Yeah. <laughs> so there you have it. So a 3D representation um, in the bluish colors, the cool colors are low are, are these valleys and the yeah. red colors are the peaks. And so, you know, you've got that big peak in the back, but that smaller peak kind of, or two, two smaller peaks ahead. And if there's a big blue, region that you'd have to cross through in order to get to the second peak, which is a set of different mutations, um, that could get, that could be really difficult, um, to pull off, um, to, to sort of thread the needle where, where you have other viruses that might not be on that highest peak, but will outcompete anything that is starting to traverse that valley. And so, yeah, so that's, yeah, oof, so in getting a nutshell, a, getting, <laughs> across, getting, getting across those peaks. It, you have to go through a valley. Think of it as an energy barrier in a way. Yeah. It's hard to do. And That's right. Th but they're saying in chronically infected patients, because there's less, there's a long time for this to happen. So you're sp spawning many, many mutations. So yep. at random, one is going to arise that allows you to cross this uh, this this valley. That's right. And that sort of gets into that idea of the, like the patterns, the more complex patterns, the pairs of mutations that are co-occurring. Yeah, so it's yeah. just it's hard to hit. It's just hard to hit those combinations that might work um, to go through while the other viruses, the more fit viruses are sort of just will outcompete if the, the more sort of exploration the, the, the genomes are doing there. 
Yeah, it's a really interesting idea. Um, and and I th- and I think what it, I mean for me, sort of the take home is, um, and both from this work and other work is that there really is a lot of evolution going on in these um, during these chronic infections. Now, as we were saying, how that relates to then the rare cases where these potentially go on, and whether th- th- this is seeding the variants of concern. I, my guess is it's not an either or that there's some that there's like different possibilities, yeah, but this yeah. seems like it's probably in the game. And in fact, there is another. I didn't have time to pull out the details on this. I saw just sort of across my radar, another recent study um, that was more looking, <clears throat> you know, not at the alpha and pre-alpha, which this is sort of early in the pandemic, the analysis they're doing here, but actually more recent, just um, sampling of um, uh, uh, how often do we see the mutations associated with Omicron um, coming up. And in fact, um, a pretty striking scenario of convergent evolution where we're independently um, a lot of the um, mutations that have been sort of flagged as the ones that def- both, but that define Omicron in terms of um, potentially their function to increase the fitness of the virus, um, those appear to be popping up independently, which is probably not too surprising given the prevalence of the virus um, and given sort of shared differences in immune competence across the population. And so but the, what I think what that those signals do, and it's sort of consistent, I would say, with this analysis as well, is that it says that, you know, Omicron kind of came out of, like, we were talking about how Omicron kind of came out of the blue um, a while ago. But in fact, um, it's not so rare for the virus to hit on these combinations of mutations. We're seeing it now independently in multiple scenarios. And so, you know, I think what that says is that even if, like, one rare event in one population center with an immunocompromised patient or, or collection of them, like even if that one is like doesn't pan out, there's going to be the virus is going to uh, find a way to borrow from Jurassic Park here. Um, the, <laughs> there's a lot of ways to get to the same solution um, as we're sort of continuing on this, um, you know, uncontrolled massive experiment of a, of a virus having plenty of opportunity to sample mutations. So, so someone said, why don't we have screen shares today? And I, I'm a little remiss today. Yeah, I'm very sorry. About that. <laughs> no. I'm, in, yeah. I'm in my new environment here. But this is figure one yeah. that Nels was talking about, where they look at changes across the genome, right? So here's the yeah. SARS-CoV-2 protein. There's NSP1 yep. at the left, and there's the spike at the right. And these are yep. the sequences from chronic infections, from uh, the variants of concern, and then all the global sequences, you know, that they have here. early the yep. changes across the whole genome here. Um, yeah. So our, our Y axis is the events, which is how many times in that yeah. sampling do you see a mutation in that location? And so you can see that, yeah, the yeah, this is great. It's sort of like we're doing our kind of review um, with and this the is the shares. this is the epistasis data where they're looking for interactions, yep. right? And this That's is right. where they come up with, you know, spike and membrane and ORF one A that we talked about that are really intriguing, but you know, not a lot of uh, data, so hard to uh, to yeah, agree what they mean. Good now, we have hypothesis a, generator. We yep. have a couple of good questions. Let's uh, yeah, let's take let's some go. of those. So Volvox Fantastic. says, does Orphate have a signature of selection too? Isn't this against all what is known about Orphate? And it's included on this uh, map here, right? There are changes in Orphate. I'm not sure you would call them a signature, right, Nels? Yeah, I agree. And so the, um, and this is, uh, yeah, actually, I didn't do a deeper dive into like, that would be interesting to go back to their data and do that deeper dive into, okay, are there um, specific signatures? And I have to say, actually, you know, so in overall, um, they so they use some tools to think about adaptive evolution. But for the um, title of the paper, which is Drivers of Adaptive Evolution, it actually doesn't go super deep into actually sussing out those signals. But yeah, this is, I think, yeah. I think, Volvox, your point is exactly right, that you would want to um, take, like, and I think, you know, this kind of analysis and having this data to kind of, like take a specific look and then you can go back and start to ask. And I think there's other studies, right, that have done more of this. So you, you, the tools I'm talking about are both population genetics tools, but also even um, kind of um, DNDS based tools. So you're looking for the rates mm-hmm. of non-synonymous versus synonymous substitutions. Um, and there's plenty of um, studies that have, have sort of dug in that way. You could take a closer look at ORF8. Is it, can you remind me, Vincent, I'm, I always forget, is it ORF7 where that, where you commonly see adaptive deletions? That's ORF8. 
Oh, oh, that is Orphate. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So you know, in, in SARS yep. one, uh, Orphate was deleted relatively early in the outbreak, and then all subsequent isolates had that deletion. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Orphate deletions have been seen in SARS CoV two, but they're not predominant. Interestingly, they occur oh, sporadically, yeah. and they don't seem to have the fitness to to make them drive through the population. Yeah. That is interesting. So yeah, sorry, I was kind of thinking ORF seven, but it, I should have yeah, been thinking ORF eight. And so it is true. So it's del in addition to point mutations, deletions could be adaptive. But I think Vincent's point is a good one, which is then you're looking for that kind of you can't a rate of deletion or relative. It's hard to find a denominator there, and so um, you're looking for sweeps. And the fact that it's been sporadic suggest that yeah that it's probably not um at the top of the list for SARS-2 for some reason or another yeah now what's interesting of course is that these viruses undergo recombination and they haven't looked at that which would be interesting to know if they're common crossovers or if it's too complicated or whatever uh that's another story i guess agree that's an uh, important one andrew says question would early genome changes that increase fitness early on preclude others later i.e a funneling effect mm. or can any earlier change be reversed that's a great question. So I think that, um, yeah, so it's, it's, and it comes down to probabilities. So the idea of a funneling effect, another way of saying that might be that the probability gets lower that you would kind of, um, you know, so making a single mutation across the whole genome is pretty easy to do. Reversing a single mutation at one point in across the genome, that's a much less, just from a random mutation standpoint, a lot less likely to happen, but does happen. So you get reversions and especially if there's strong selection, um, and so, yeah, and that's actually that it's that question, Andrew, I think gets out of some of those the ideas that are still, um, you know, tested or vied over on these fitness landscapes is and that's an example of like one of these valleys, perhaps, is you've so you've made or a way that you're blocked from moving from one peak to another is if a mutation has happened that was selected early that was on this sort of peak that's lower than a possible one into the future. If you have, in order to traverse to the next peak, you have to reverse that mutation. That's like, that's, that lowers the probability or it puts up a block to do that. doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means the probabilities are a lot lower. And so, um, that certain, those kind of effects, um, can certainly influence that. I think the longer the pandemic goes, the more likely there is that you, that you see these rare things happening in these sort of combinations emerging, but yeah, that's, there are all of these, you know, we talk about, um, adaptive evolution kind of, it kind of rolls off the tongue in sort of some dangerous ways is if the virus can just do whatever it wants. But what we don't talk about a lot is all the constraint on the virus, which could be, you know, as Andrew's defining it here, like a funneling effect, it actually gets harder for different reasons as the virus is evolving. And so I think what you'd love to do somehow is if we could learn enough about these like funnels or um, fitness valleys, et cetera, is you, you know, then there's all kinds of ideas in this space um, from a sort of application standpoint is could we force a virus population into a valley where the probability of it getting out is really low? So it's like you, like the virus, there's a, you, <laughs> the virus is enticed, so to speak, or there's selection even and standing variation for the virus to end up on a location, in that landscape where it's almost impossible to get back up onto a, a higher fitness peak. And so I think the idea is pretty compelling and an interesting way of thinking about sort of applications of evolutionary analysis to deliver on that, um, given some of the complexities and how little we know about, you know, we, we can, we're very good at cataloging a set of shared mutations, but how that sort of relates to the then possibility for the virus to become more fit into the future. If we could get a little bit more sophisticated, I think, in our knowledge there, that's an interesting, I think, viable approach for SARS-2 and maybe even pandemics of the future. Uh, so J.K. writes, I'm sure I missed something, but if we're talking about the emergence of VOCs from immunocompromised patients, wouldn't we initially be seeing drift that also happens to carry the benefit of fitness? Yeah, no, absolutely. And so, but here's where, so, and I think this is where um, Vincent's point on recombination comes into play. So absolutely, J.K. And so, and, and, you know, wherever those VOCs are coming from, whether it's acute infections, chronic infections, co-infections, et cetera, the more recombination that's happening. So as there is like, let's just call them hitchhiker mutations that, so you have like a mutation that might be adaptive, raises the virus fitness coming along with it just by chance are a number of other mutations that are neutral or maybe even slightly deleterious. Um, if that sort of valuable beneficial mutation 
for in, in terms of the virus, which uh, we were inferring is or we're, we think we're seeing in some of these variants of concern, um, as those are sort of the success stories from the virus side. Um, if recombination is happening at a high rate, which that's kind of what coronaviruses do for a living, um, it, then those um, you know those nearby mutations will will quickly potentially get um, uh, separated mm -hmm. from that mutation that does well. And so here's where you know that's where I think um, continuing to try to learn about both the process of recombination for coronaviruses like SARS two. And then how to um, both analyze and then sort of think about how that contributes to the adaptive evolution. That's an important piece that's maybe a little bit behind. Again, it's just harder to do that kind of analysis than it is to um, tally the point mutations. But yeah, no, it's a good point, JK. So one of the things I love about these live streams, they're kind of like classrooms and that people in the back are having conversations, right? Uh, but you don't have to whisper. So, uh, for example, right. Jeff says, Nell's put it much better than I did. Uh, and, uh, and Andrew says, thanks for the answer. We almost figured it out in the discussion. I love it. Yeah, I love it. All right. That's Marco, really fun. Marco asks, is it possible for a DNA virus to alter an RNA virus or vice versa if a person mm. happened to be co-infected? Uh, and I would say absolutely. And I think co-infections are the rule, actually. We don't often look, yeah. but I think most people are co-infected. And yes, viruses make gene products that can alter the infection by another virus for sure, right, uh, Now, Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's some really cool research going on here. And it might not just be viruses, other infectious microbes. So, you know, if you're infected with bacteria or, or what's the composition of your microbiome, are there con like almost genetic or biological conversations happening between mm -hmm. not only viruses, but other microbes as well? A very interesting active area of research. Marco, I think it's a great point. Um, you know, in, in one that, so two, certainly two RNA viruses in play. We already mentioned some of the basis of being immunocompromised is if you have an HIV infection and then you put SARS-2 on top of that. Um, you know, think about some of the other major um, uh, pandemics out there, t um, tuberculosis or plasmodium causing malaria all, and, and what that means for then co-infection scenarios. As things get more complicated, our knowledge sort of goes out the window, but I think that's exactly right to think about how sort of the complexity of what's going on as different microbes are influencing our immune systems. That's going to, of course, influence what happens with um, any with SARS-2 or any other sort of collection of, of infectious microbes for sure. In fact, we've, so, done, yeah. we've done papers a long time ago on TWIV which show that in a mouse mm. model, if you co-infect with two different viruses, the disease you get is very different than in any singly infected animal. So I think this is an area that's been not very explored and yet is very important because, as I said, we're all multiply infected. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. No, and the monkeypox example is an interesting one, too. I mean, that one's still at, um, I mean, worth keeping an eye on, still at such a sure. low um, prevalence. But that's a, um, the pox viruses are really interesting and as you know, so these DNA, actually, if we think about these two, so an RNA virus and a DNA virus, we've picked the two super tankers, the ones that have massive genomes, the pox viruses in particular, bring a lot of genes in sort of into the cytoplasm as they're setting up shop mm -hmm. and ones that are immunomodulatory um, as well. And so, yeah, it's um, the co-infection scenario. I mean, one way of thinking about it is um, that that's another sort of example of being immunocompromised or immunochanged is if yeah. there's another, if there's two things going on versus one. All right. Ziziva303 asks, would this be a question of finding a safe local minimum in the virus's genomic space? And is there hmm. an actual chance to compute such features? Ooh. Yeah, that's, so that's the dream, I would say. And I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, so people are trying, I know people are trying to do that, how close they're getting to doing that is the other question. And so, yeah, this sort of safe, like are these traps, these like um, landscape traps for the for the virus and, and bringing them all in there. I mean, the other tricky part here, right, is that um, is getting everything into that trap, I think is like a, just a practical issue. And so, mm. um, you know, so maybe we're a little bit farther ahead in areas of actually not going after the viruses themselves, um, but the um, vectors. So when we think about uh, some of the arboviruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes and in terms of interventions going in and like making all of the mosquitoes sterile. Um, and then pretty soon the mosquito population crashes and then the vehicle to transmit or move that virus goes away. 
Um, you know, the sort of advantage of that is that you're tar by targeting the vector, you, it's sort of like you've got a clear target, whereas tar it, that's less diverse than all of that viral diversity to try to find one of these sort of safe local minima. Um, and so I think there's just, um, yeah. And so uh, both are valid approaches and would be spectacular if they work in the long term and are sustainable. I'd say we're farther ahead on some of those sort of easier things to target, um, including the vectors. Uh, Jeff asks, is it possible to model mutations leading to new variants that would allow us to get ahead of VOCs and make a bivalent vaccine that doesn't target a VOC that's already been displaced? Yeah. yeah so that's the case with the new vaccines for the fall that, that what they're based on is already gone, right? Yeah, no, that's right. And so that's the trick here. And um, yeah, I mean, my, so um, it's probably not the most satisfying answer, but my um, intuition on this one is that that in just because of so the complexity and the practicalities of deploying a vaccine um, on, you know, you, you can't just say, OK, I mean, the mRNA vaccines are spectacular because they're programmable, um, but that doesn't mean you program them in the next day. You've got this thing ready to go, at least not yet um, in terms of all of the logistics. The, and really, you know, we're talking in, in not anytime soon, because anytime you do this, you have to scale it up to the whole population. So until we have, you know, like our mRNA synthesizers, like in your, in our kitchen. So you've got your, like your coffee machine, your toaster oven and your <laughs> mRNA vaccine synthesizer. Like once that's deployed across the world, then maybe we could do this. But, um, the, given the practicality of this and the bottlenecks of vaccine production, really tricky. And so then, I mean, your point is a good one, Jeff, right? Is then, well, given that lead time, we'd really like to be better at predicting what is what's next. And I think what we've proven so far is that we're just in our infancy of, you know, like when Omicron showed up, I think it kind of caught everyone by surprise. It was, you know, everyone's like, wow, there's a lot of different mutations here that we haven't seen before. Both, yeah. So both yeah. in our surveillance, we're underpowered, both in our knowledge or, um, you know, virus forecasting or predictability, like, you know, knowing that a thunderstorm is going to happen in seven days and weather prediction is still like that. I think that field is way out in front of us in terms of knowing what a virus population is going to do three months from now. And so, yeah, it's tough. I think for me then, you know, a, a, another parallel approach that's super important, obviously, is getting at, you know, we can't make these fine scale predictions. Is there an intervention or a vaccine that has more broad protection? And so, you know, and then that, of course, that's a balancing act. I, I think the notion of like a pan coronavirus vaccine seems pretty unlikely, but could there be a pan Sarbeco coronavirus um, mm. vaccine? Maybe we're getting a little bit closer there. That seems like another area for, you know, that would be ideal is that you, 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 because we're so kind of, um, you know, in our infancy and in predicting uh, mutations, uh, can, we, can we step back and get a broader protection that allows for a lot of things that we can't predict currently? Yeah, I just think it's with such a large spike alone, it's just very hard. And many people thought before Omicron that the variants were exhausted already. Said, oh, yeah, look, here are the, but it's not true because it's more complicated no. than we know. So yeah. uh, Christopher says with immune escape memory, TMB cells miss mm. some epitopes. Does somatic hypermutation uh, yeah. produce activated cells that can support the infection? So Yes, if you let somatic hypermutation proceed, even with an ancestral vaccine, you can make antibodies that will recognize variants that are not even around yet. That's yep. the beauty of somatic hypermutation. And what we did wrong was to give doses one and two of mRNA vaccines three to four weeks apart, not long enough. And then mm. we realized if you gave a booster a couple of months later, you now made antibodies to Omicron, which weren't even present in the first vaccine. So it's an amazing process that, that can handle that. And by the way, yeah. the, the P cell epitopes don't really change in the variants very minimally. So yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, underlines like, I mean, our adaptive immune systems are spectacular. So Tom There's... says a, a broad <laughs> landscape trap would be a virus adapted to only one host like polio. Is, what do you think of that mm. now? Oh yeah. So yeah, that's certainly, so that's one way of thinking it. Oh, I agree. Like, that's a nice idea, Tom. So like, yeah, so how do we define that landscape? And so, um, I mean, I guess it, it depends on how you want to, I think, so for the most part, like the assumptions that you put into the landscape. So, and if you draw one landscape, 
kind of that th- like that 3D picture that Vincent flashed up a few minutes ago, you know, you might just say, okay, that's for humans. And then you would say, you'd actually even draw like a next landscape over, which might be mice. And then, you know, so it'd be, and then you, and there could be, and there certainly could be hops or spillovers or spillbacks, depending on how you want to, the language you want to use. But to me, that almost feels like I would draw a second landscape. Um, mm. for thinking about a different host. Um, and in part because, you know, so, um, but it, that's arbitrary and you can make the case to just draw, you could draw a lands. The landscape could also represent every host. Um, then it just becomes like, you know, how do you sort of squeeze meaning out of what you're representing in terms of the peaks and valleys? I mean, that's the other kind of trick with uh, some of the landscapes is like how theoretical are they based or how, or what are, so when you're drawing those axes and you're deciding how high is your red peak, how low is your blue valley, you know, um, you can base that on, what are you basing that on? So are you actually making real fitness calculations based on experiments? Are you doing it on sort of theoretical ideas? And we, you kind of see, yeah across the board to do a really good fitness landscape. You'd want as many measurements as possible against the diversity of the host and, you know, or, and the diversity of the virus, but holding, you know, if you hold one constant, you might have higher resolution to think about what the virus does against this host or set of hosts. But then as you add in more variability on both sides, I think it, it, the, at least for me, um, it starts to break down in terms of um, like, how do I think about this? So I would be tempted um, to like, just do a sec, like a, um, a, a human landscape, depending on how you were drawing it, a mouse landscape, ferret landscape, bird landscape, bat landscape. And then, uh, and, and there'd be different peaks and valleys, which represents how diverse our immune systems are, you know, and, and, um, the genetic diversity out there, it's sort of like a different ball game. And, but that does, but you're in terms of the bigger idea. Yeah, absolutely. That's like, um, moving between these, it depends on host diversity as well or can depend on that. Yeah. So Jeff says we need a vaccine that mutates. Well, yeah, well actually, <laughs> that's our immune system. <laughs> it's our immune system. That's right. Yeah. It's really good yeah. at uh, adapting. Yeah. Um, but you know, the attenuated vaccines that reproduce mutate, of course, and uh, the polio vaccine, in fact, you know, the, the, the mutations in the genome that reduce its neurovirulence, they revert within a few days in your intestine. And we think those viruses are selective for because they're more fit in your intestine. And in fact, that contributes to a better immune response. So it's an interesting idea, right? And then a few of those can, those can cause paralysis in one in one and a half million kids, unfortunately. So that's not a mm. good thing. So this is the problem with having a vaccine mutate <laughs> is that it yeah, can have untoward uh, effects, right? Yeah. Yeah. So live attenuated vaccines where the, the virus, and as you're saying, the vaccine is mutating Yeah, for better and for worse. Yep. Volvox writes, boy, I would want to buy my own vaccine printer. <laughs> we managed quite well to get everyone a mobile phone in 30 to 40 years. Yeah, it's right, impossible yeah. to have a synthesizer at your local supplier. So Nels, what's the idea? So the CDC <laughs> says, okay, here's the sequence for this week's vaccine. Go That's print right. it. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I can I can see some liability issues. <laughs> yeah. Well, and yeah, so maybe to throw some cold water on that idea too, like, you know, we're still learning. For, so certainly for um, still, like what it, so there's all kinds of stuff and maybe um, influenza virology could say the most about this. Some of the ideas of like the original antigenic sin. So as we're souping up our immune systems or exposed to viruses, um, the idea that our immune systems will sort of train on what they see at one point, And that might influence what happens down the road. That's of course true. You know, your point, Vincent, that w- the timing of a booster could actually have a big impact on the kind of immune response that you then enjoy for sure, sure. some set of time. And so, yeah. And I also, I don't want to get too exuberant here. Like the idea of printing out a vaccine every morning and um, a new one every morning and then, um, you know, drinking it with your like, a little injection or like a little nasal spray with your cup of coffee or something of a vaccine. Um, you know, I think what we sometimes underestimate is like how incredible our, our actual immune systems are. And so, you know, just as we were discussing, like even, you know, one shot, two shots, three shots and, and actually using these intervals in that memory, et cetera, um, that there's some good reasons not to kind of just keep the ball moving here, um, constantly, but I, you know, as, as, as we learn more about how to get that right, I still like, let's say the, 
a nasal vaccine comes along <laughs> and I can just go down to my coffee maker and next to it is sitting my little nasal spray and dial that in based on like CDC downloads this and says, okay, every six months do a different, like, I'm curious about that. What if your printer gets a computer virus? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, then we're, <laughs> this is the the Internet of Things, right? We're yeah, we're opening up new problems. That's yeah, right. <laughs> Very uh -oh. interesting. But I do that's... want to point out, you know, despite <laughs> there have been a lot of comments about uh, gloom. Um, as Nels will attest, it's an arms race. Uh, one side doesn't want to actually eliminate the other. Uh, well, I guess we don't want to eliminate viruses because they're probably beneficial. And if viruses oh. eliminate their hosts, then they're gone too. So it's a balance. And that's why yeah. life still exists on the earth, right? <laughs> Absolutely right. And it, yeah, and so these arms races, I mean, that's, this is kind of um, one of the themes of my lab is we're really curious what the impact is. So as as we as populations diversify on both sides and mm -hmm. sort of feeding in like so that diverse that generation of diversity is obviously a beneficial thing um but the balance between that and then you know when things go out of balance um and uh, which happens with pandemics which happens you know all of the time and the sort of rise and fall of populations all through history um that we infer from all this phylogenetic analysis that's all like on the the other side of that coin is that, you know, as we sit here and um, podcast together, live stream together, um, you know, we're the beneficiaries in a big way when we think about, you know, I, I'm, well, and for me, it's, you know, just a, a personal note of the last two weeks and, um, you know, being infected with SARS too. Like I'm f feeling lucky, feeling thankful for sort of this all of the above approaches, the healthcare that's available to me the ability to get these vaccines, the ability to sort of step through this with an immune system that I was gifted just by luck from all of my ancestors. <laughs> I mean, the fact that I'm here live streaming with everyone, it's just, it's just a joy. Technology is amazing, right? Yeah. yeah. It certainly is. Yeah. Nels, you want to uh, take a couple of these uh, emails that we have in the show notes? Yeah, let's do that. Let's open the mailbag. So actually, um, Tom, that we've already heard from, I wanted to just um, <laughs> I pulled your... Uh, email Tom um, to read here. So Tom writes, greetings. Tuivo is a pleasure, uh, but many of us don't know when the live stream comes up and we miss the opportunity for real-time interaction. Is there some way of posting ahead of time, even by a day, when the live stream would be? Is there a notification list? Uh, neither Vincent's YouTube website nor microbetv.com have specific information other than it's generally a month, sometimes Monday, Wednesday. 11 a.m., 1 p.m. Eastern time. Hoping to catch the next one. And you did, Tom. Great to see you here. Um, best regards, Tom. Uh, go ahead, Vincent. Sorry. Well, the, yeah. the way it works is that uh, I put a notification on YouTube a, couple, a day at least ahead of time, usually a couple of days. And if you're subscribed to the channel and you have notifications turned on on your phone, then you will get a notification uh, of the, of the stream, but you can always go to the YouTube channel and, and check for upcoming, uh, streams and it should be there. I try to post okay. it ahead of time, but you know, sometimes I get late because I need to have someone do this for me at some point. That's yeah. what we're working on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still working on that. I'll try to tweet that out. If so, if anyone is following me on Twitter, I'll try to put that up a few days ahead of time. Once we have it, but we're also a little by the seat of our pants. So we had to reschedule this one, um, when I was kind of down, um, a couple weeks ago. Um, and then sometimes our schedules, um, to get that to line up, especially for, so, you know, on occasions where we're trying to line up a guest. So I, I've, I've been getting a lot of fun comments about our interview with Alex Kagan, uh, when we were talking about somatic mutations and, and then also some of his interesting stuff with science illustration, science sketches. And so when we're lining that up, sometimes we have to kind of bend our schedules a little bit. So, um, yeah, it would be great. We'd, I mean, we want to do everything we can to have as many of you here so that we can interact like this and yeah. build and and kind of um, grow and build on this together. So we'll all, I'll start to try to tweet this out a few days ahead of time, and then we'll continue to try to get more ways of communicating it. Thanks, Tom. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Jeff says, I need a This Week in Receptionist. That's absolutely <laughs> right. Um, all right, I'll take the next one from Jim. Mm -hmm. Excellent episode with Alex Kagan, number 77. That was on mutation rates in different organisms, right? Yeah, that's right. Different mammals. Quick question for Nels. 
with respect to the Luantin study, 50th anniversary. In the past 20 years, there's been a lot of research on germline inheritance involving molecules other than those found specifically in base sugar phosphate, i.e. deoxyribonucleic acid, cytosine, adenine, thymine, guanine, i.e. DNA. We now have a broad awareness of the presence of histones in an inherited genetic package and also knowledge of the prevalence of heritable post-translational modifications to all components of heritable material. The human genome, DNA bases alone, may be a non-issue in relation to race, per Lewontin's 50-year-old study, but germline epigenetics above the gene, above the DNA itself, may be a big issue with respect to human difference and specifically racial differences. Why is there never any discussion of the effect of phenotype of epigenetic realities of heritable material? There's always confusion these days when the word genetic is spoken or written. Does this mean the bases only or the bases plus methylations? <laughs> <laughs> is a gene a stretch of bases or a stretch of bases plus heritable modifications that may be conserved for thousands or millions of years? We all love the idea that humans are genetically identical, Lee Wanton's idea, as far as bases are concerned. We obviously are. But what are the effects of all the other heritable additions? There's an octomer of histones every 126 bases, a lot of heritable stuff with all manner of avenues for difference. Why does cutting-edge bioscientist Nels Elby go <laughs> all warm and fuzzy on Lee Wanton's observation, ignoring 20 years of germline epigenetics? Why not celebrate human difference? Harvard professor Howard Gardner discusses seven types of human intelligence. Perhaps there's a heritable component to these differences. Thank you for the superb series, Twiv, Twim, Twivo. Uh, Jim is a, a, a graduate of Harvard and author of Distill the Zeit, The Bliss Engine, and Station Point. What do you think, Nels? Whew, there's a lot going on here. So first of all, thanks for writing. Um, and I just wanted to open, I guess, by conceding the point that I'm Try to be warm and fuzzy just as a general rule, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> you may be even more fuzzy if, if my beard's longer. But, um, you know, I think a couple ideas to me at least feel a little bit scrambled here, to be honest. So just to talk a little bit about this, um, to bring back Dick Lewinton's, um, Lewinton's study that was um, the 50th anniversary. There was a special issue. I think this was my, a pick of the week. Um, that I did a couple episodes ago. Um, and, you know, and so the idea here, and it's really fascinating, I was kind of um, looking at this a little bit recently. So um, the paper reported this idea. So Lewinton was going, I think, to give a seminar in like uh, somewhere in Illinois, so Southern Illinois, and took the bus. And on the bus, he did all these calculations, just, you know, this is 50 years ago, and um, was calculating that there's something like, or his um, calculation was that if you look at genetic diversity at a location, there's 85% of diversity um, within individuals versus across groups. Mm -hmm. In and so this idea that you know, we, and we talked about this um, extensively with our interview with Joe Graves um, in his book *Racism, Not Race*. So race is a social construct, not a biological one. And um, Dick Lewinton's um, uh, st study held up 50 years, actually is held up in not in every detail, but if anything in the genomic era, we think it's like 85 or 90% of genetic variation within individuals and not. And so that sort of dispels the notion of um, a biological definition of race. Okay. So now let's start to talk about some of the ideas of epigenetics and how that might re relate here. And, um, and uh, I'll confess at the outset, I, um, I don't know about you, Vincent, but there's just like some topics in biology that I like think are fascinating others that I think are fascinating, but I just can't for some reason, like really get into it. Like I can't, <laughs> like <laughs> there's so much, it feels like our, at least for me, my brain has limited space. And so sure. I've kind of av avoided, like I try to avoid, like for a while I tried to avoid RNA viruses. I thought they're too streamlined. They're too. And so I only think I'll think about DNA viruses. Usually you know, eventually I break down because there's just really cool things happen in our research, et cetera. But anyway, so um, with that said, you know, so like, let's take this example of the histones that do get modified, sort of the idea of the histone code. Um, and then this can influence how DNA is packaged and this can influence how, you know, heterochromatin or chromatin areas, um, sort of genomic zip codes where genes are expressed more or less. And so the thing is about the histones, those are actually highly, con like, so this is the one area of the genome or the genes encoding almost every flavor of histone is completely conserved across our whole species. So, um, so that sort of, so like, I think actually we're, I think it's the reverse. I would say, um, uh, Jim, that, you know, we're, we're happy to celebrate 
human diversity. Um, but the uh, but you know the histones that we've picked now a gene that's actually identical across all humans, mm -hmm. and so absolutely, you know. Our environments are acting in, uh, and there's sort of these epigenetic, uh, the influence of the marks. There's some really interesting active work, pretty tough work to do on the heritability of sort of, you know, the marks both on these proteins and on, um, you know, DNA methylation patterns, et cetera. Um, but those are sort of common across the board. And the only histones that um, actually evolve rapidly are, are centromeric histones, which is another really cool arms race, we think, mm. which is actually these sort of meiotic drive systems where the chromosomes are competing to make it into the egg, to be fertilized, to go on um, and, and be the offspring. And so that's the, but all the other histones across our whole species are the same. And so that's like that example I would actually hold as the common thing. And then all this great genetic diversity that again, doesn't map to biological races. Um, maps to being human. And so I think we can celebrate that without having to sort of invoke um, those situations. I mean, and then and then we, we're touching on intelligence here. And so I guess my take on this is like now we're getting into, so already like we're, when we start to take kind of complicated biology, how the environment is interpreted by mm. sort of um, protein marks. And then we're laying on top of that another really complicated concept, which is intelligence and how we define that. I guess, I, actually, I, I want to tell one quick story, which is my favorite example of epigenetics when, you know, this is what, you know, when genetics class, like the regular instructor is, can't make it. And then the second stringer can't make it. And then they say, okay, let's bring LD off the bench to talk about <laughs> epigenetics. So it's like, I'm the last person you want to do this, but the story I tell is my favorite experiment in epigenetics. And it's, it actually involves um, paramecium, this pond critter that swims around with Volvox. And there's this great experiment, maybe 60 years ago or so by um, Sonnenborn. And what they did is actually a microsurgery on this single cell paramecium. And so the surface of the cell, it's studded with cilia. This is how this thing swims, these ciliates. And they did a microsurgery where they cut off a little row of cilia and they reversed it. And so they changed the polarity of the cilia just on that section. It's very obvious because all the other cilia are going in one direction. These cilia are going in the other direction. Then the cell like survives the microsurgery, it recovers, and it starts dividing. And here's where it gets wild. The offspring of that paramecium has that reversal of cilia just in that location. <laughs> this is epigenetics. There is no DNA here. <laughs> and to me, this is all. So how do you do that? There's like somehow this cortical inheritance in a single cell. To me, that's intelligence. Like that is the, how do you like, uh, so I, <laughs> so I'm probably like a little off the mainstream here. But I, I find intelligence in things like, you know, the octopus or a single cell ciliate. These are the things that capture my imagination. I'm a little less enamored by, you know, whether someone can divide a long fraction in my own species. And so these other diverse forms of, of intelligence are the ones that sort of to, to get my juices flowing. So anyway, Jim, I, I thank you for your letter. Um, if I'm not coming across as warm and fuzzy on some of those ideas, this is probably probably um, an area where we might uh, disagree on a couple topics, but I, I do appreciate the conversation. And, and of course it's worth thinking about all of these things going forward, but, um, but are, you know, but worth it to also take the time. Are we getting it right? Are we getting the biology right here? I would say Nels that genetic is DNA and epigenetics is modifications that we've been talking about. That's, that's the terminology we've given to it, right? Oh yeah, so the but there is a common thread here, which is heritability. Sure, and that's sure. a and and that's a fair point. Although you know, I think it's worth it when we're thinking about evolution. It's worth thinking about the scales of time here. So, um, you know, DNA is a pretty um, in in mutations. Let's say just to the A, T, Cs, and Gs. That's a pretty um, you know, it's almost like permanent ink in a sense. It's probably the, like it's changing, but the ink is uh, endures over generations. Now, when we're talking about epigenetics, so there's certainly heritability like that paramecium case where you reverse mm. the cilia and it propagates for generations through some mechanism. We have no idea. Um, but, but, you know, I don't, I don't think it's as indelible or as enduring. So I think the bat in, in kind of the epigen and I, again, I don't follow the field um, very closely, but uh, to me, I think, or some of the best evidence I've seen for sort of multi-generator, multi-generational epigenetics comes through in, in examples of the heritability going generation, like several generations is in, in like nematodes, C. elegans, the worm. Um, some evidence of that in mice, 
um, some suggestions of that in humans. Although there, I think the record is pretty thin, to be honest, mm. and it's taking um, some complex scenarios and sort of threading that along. So yeah, I, so I agree. I'm not trying to like, um, th there is shared heritability, but how long that heritability endures, and in, in, in especially in our own species, yeah. I think is, is an open question. So Nels, if does it bother you when people say, well, nothing bothers you, but does it bother no. you when people <laughs> say genetic mutation? Versus mutation? Yeah, I think mutation is all oh. you need, right? Yeah, agree. Because I, I, I think a mutation is defined as a change in nucleic acid, so you don't need to say genetic mutation. Yeah, Why, why don't you take that last one from Eric? <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. So Eric writes, uh, Twivo 77 with Alex Kagan was an amazing, another amazing episode. The demonstration that somatic mutation rates were reduced in large, long-lived animals, presumably to de decrease the risk of developing cancer was very elegant. The discussion made me wonder whether the tissues collected, whether the tissues collected over sequential generations of mice could similarly be used to measure the rate of epigenetic quote unquote mutation using sequencing tools that detect DNA methylation. Could inheritable epigenetic changes in germline provide a faster mechanism of evolution than traditional changes that are at the nucleotide level? Can new methylation patterns in germ lines be considered the functional equivalent of DNA mutations if they affect gene expression? Curious, Eric Delwert. Yeah, so now we're kind of digging in uh, or taking that question that you were raising just a second ago um, with this letter and going farther. So yeah, I think, and I, maybe I would um, go back to this idea of so like share the idea of heritability being shared, but it may be at very different time scales. Mm. Um, and I think for me, yeah, the idea of a, that the methylation patterns, considering them the functional equivalent of DNA mutations, I don't think I'm there. I think the um, there's there's enough differences here. So you, certainly, I'm, I'm not. I think epigenetic um, differences or, or methylation marks, however you're defining this, and actually the definition of epigenetics can um, go from the more traditional one, like that paramecium case I was going to, to sort of, if you just change the, uh, put a post-translationally or post-transcriptionally put a, or even on DNA, put a, a mark that that's epigenetics without function. Um, kind of different animals. And that doesn't mean they can't have massive impacts, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know that um, conflating the same mechanisms that we see in, with DNA heritability with epigenetic heritability makes that sense. I think there's a lot of different stuff going on here. And so some, uh, some common concepts and themes, but I don't know that, it, yeah. uh, how much that holds up. Not, I'm not arguing against, um, so I think that idea of looking at, you know, going through the generations and there's, this is active areas of research. I think one of uh, my favorite labs doing this might be Catherine Dulock's lab at Harvard. And they're thinking about and using mouse models and thinking about, um, how this relates to neurobiology, memory, other things mm -hmm. like that. And, um, there's some really interesting ways forward, um, how that gets into heritability. If you're wanted to study that, I think C. elegans is probably the place to go. You're going to get, you kind of got that foothold of multi-generational outcomes that seem pretty robust. Um, and then, but yeah, as we move into mammals and certainly as we move to humans, I think it's a, it, it's, it gets complicated in a hurry. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. For, thanks for all these letters. <laughs> Lamarck yes. would be laughing in his grave. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sonnenberg and Paramecia. It's been a long time since I've heard that. Yeah. Nels does that. He likes to bring that because it's all good stuff, right? It's, it's, there's, it's incredible stuff. Really fun. Genetic mutation is only used for lay audience. I've noticed that, Neil. Uh, often yeah. in the press, you see them say, G you know, this VOC has a genetic mutation. I say, you don't need to say genetic mutation. It's just a yeah. mutation. Yep. Anyway, uh, what sh shall we do some uh, picks of the week now? Let's what do, do some picks. Yeah, wow, we're already burned through an hour and a half here. This is this um, discussion has been spectacular. Um, so I've got, yeah, I'll start with my science pick of the week here. So... Um, Earlier, I think I was picking the Webb telescope that's been deployed. This is this, my goodness, high degree of difficulty uh, launch deployment um, whole scenario for this um, deep space telescope, the Webb telescope, and it's working. <laughs> so um, we haven't seen, I'm linking to an article here, and the headline is NASA scientists say images from the Webb telescope nearly brought them to tears. And so mm. um, I think we're about two weeks away, maybe 
week and a half away from them actually revealing <laughs> these striking images that they're seeing, but it's working. And so, um, you know, this multi mirror deployment, I guess there's even been like little um, nicks that they're taking on, but they program that in. I think they've got 20 years of, uh, of observations ahead using this telescope to really look into deep time. And I, th I'm, you know, if we have to make predictions here. I'm going to forecast or prognosticate that th we're going to see some incredible things starting about two weeks from now. So um, the Webb telescope appears to be going at full strength. The NASA scientists are looking at the data now and um, uh, promising to start releasing images in about two weeks. And so we probably won't be podcasting before that. So I wanted to get my pick in early and put this on everyone's radar to keep an eye. I think we'll be discussing this really fun, um, different area of discovery and sort of incredible breakthrough that might be right at our fingertips here. Um, so that's my science pick of the week. Cool. Vincent, how about you? Uh, so my pick is uh, an article in STAT, which actually was sent to me by one of the authors uh, the other day, Paul Offit. It's written by Paul Offit and John Moore. Mm. It's entitled, FDA, Don't Rush a Move to Change the COVID-19 Vaccine <laughs> Composition. As you know, the yeah. Vaccines uh, and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee from, of the FDA voted 19-2 uh, to 2 to approve mm -hmm. the use later this year of uh, COVID vaccines based on Omicron. Um, and so the vote 19 to 2, one of the dissenters was Paul Offit. <laughs> and in this article, he uh, tells you why he thinks that uh, it's too soon to, to make this change. He doesn't feel like the data support it. I mean, BA1, which is what the vaccine is based on, isn't even right. around anymore, right? And who yeah. knows what will be around in the fall? He said the data aren't really so good saying that it's going to make it and, and no one actually knows if this vaccine is going to make a difference so they're kind of just saying yeah maybe we should try it but paul is is a very measured vaccinologist and, uh, <laughs> so he, he feels otherwise so it's a very nicely written uh, article um and we will have paul on twiv a week from today so July oh wow 8th, he will come back and talk about this as well but oh very meanwhile, cool meanwhile you can check that out yeah, cool. I mean, it does highlight it's really complicated. So we're given how much we know and then what the virus will be and what, yeah, and the lag time, how to deploy a responsible vaccine at this stage seems like a tall order. Yeah. yeah. One more comment from Volvox. I think short term mm. heritable change might be beneficial to overcome mm. short term mm -hmm. changes in the environment. We see this quite mm. a lot in plants. Agree. And then there are also more stable epi alleles. That makes sense, right, now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. A lot to learn there. And, but I do think over, like I would still hold up that difference in heritability over the really long run versus as yeah. Volvox is pointing out here, the sort of short term scenarios. Um, and then if you erase all your epigenetic marks, um, you know, after like three generations or something, it's sort of like, it's almost like hitting a reset button where I don't know that we ever do that with a genome that we like our DNA, we never like just erase everything and then start over. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if there's a critter out there that does that, that would be spectacular. I'd love to study it, but good. Yeah. Thanks, Volvox. Good point. All right. That'll do it for Tweevo number 79. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash Tweevo. You can send your, well, your questions and comments to Tweevo at microbe.tv, although now we have a live stream uh, pretty much every episode, so you can just come there and uh, ask your questions and a lot of other cool people here as well. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. We'd love your your support to keep this science communication moving forward. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Nels Eldes at cellvolution.org. On Twitter, he's L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Hey, thank you, Vincent. Good to see you from the shore there. Hope you have a good afternoon out and enjoying the, the sunshine. Well, what's up for this afternoon is TWIV coming up at oh. 3 p.m. <laughs> More podcasting uh, ahead. Which takes, yeah. yeah, that's what I love to do, Nels, you know? I hear you. If, you. if you ask me what's your favorite thing, I'd say <laughs> podcasting at the moment because I get to talk with people like you in our audience today and read papers and think. I just love it. Awesome. I'm Vincent, I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, to, yeah. Tuivo, uh, to Tuivo, and in particular, Tom, for his moderation. I think less left, so otherwise I would thank him as well. So thanks, everybody. We'll be back in about a month 
uh, as soon as we finish here, Nels and I will pick another date, and then we'll we'll post it a few days uh, beforehand so that you can uh, come join us. But you guys are great. Uh, you yeah. have a great conversation among yourselves. You ask great questions, so we really enjoy it. Music you hear in Tuivo is by Trampled by Turtles. You can find their work at trampledbyturtles.com. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Till then, stay curious. And I have to find the darn plaque logo. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.